Okay, let's, uh, let's start. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Christoph Bellman from, uh, from ICTSD. Uh, well, first of all, let me welcome you all to this um, talking dispute uh, meeting, both on behalf of ICTSD and of WTI advisors. Um, as you probably know, uh, this meeting is part of what we call the talking disputes. This is the 11th talking disputes that we've been organizing. And the idea of these events is uh, basically to allow for a discussion on uh, specific disputes uh, by, by experts, interested professionals from, from different fields, from different perspectives. Uh, usually we have one, two experts kind of presenting some of the, the main aspects of the, of the case, and then a few uh, discussants uh, that comment, both from a legal and from a substantive perspective. We're going to stick to that model here. Um, for this series, usually we don't uh, deal with every single dispute that happens in the WTO. Uh, we try to focus on those where we think, uh, which we think have some kind of either systemic implications or particular relevance from uh, um, a development or environmental uh, uh, perspective. Um, you have in front of you, uh, I think, the agenda, uh, the background material. Uh, you will also find a, a feedback forms. Uh, please, when we get to the end of the meeting, uh, complete it, uh, and we will collect uh, them uh, after the meeting. Uh, needless to say that this is very important uh, to us, both ICTSD and WTI uh, advisors, uh, uh, to make sure that we can uh, make those events more uh, useful and, uh, and, and interesting. Um, this event is also uh, being uh, uh, streamed live online. Uh, and we might very well be receiving uh, comments and questions through uh, Twitter. Um, so uh, I will give, of course, priority to comments and questions in the room, uh, but uh, uh, I cannot exclude that in the course of the discussion, uh, someone will give me a list of questions asked through Twitter, and I will probably uh, direct them to uh, some of our uh, speakers. Um, the case we have in, in, in front of us, I'm not going to uh, uh, talk too much about it. I think we have much better qualified people to, uh, to do it. Um, but uh, just to explain a little bit why we thought it would be interesting uh, to, uh, to discuss it. And I think there are two main elements there that uh, kind of uh, catched our, our, our attention. Uh, first is, of course, this interplay between uh, the multilateral trading system and, um, and FTA, and particularly the, in this case, the FTA between uh, Peru and, 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 and Guatemala. How does this relate to WTO provisions, uh, particularly in cases where some arrangement in those FTAs might actually uh, uh, waive or uh, uh, go below some of the WTO uh, provisions? And the other uh, aspect uh, is, uh, of course, related to uh, the concerns uh, around uh, the price band uh, system. Uh, and more broadly, uh, what kind of uh, options might exist for countries who are concerned about uh, price volatility uh, and uh, ensure some kind of price stabilization mechanisms uh, uh, what kind of measures are at their disposal. Uh, we know that this obviously is uh, 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 of major concern to a number of, uh, of developing countries, particularly in this time of high price volatility, which we're living in, and we're probably going to live in, in, the few, uh, in a few more uh, years. So these are the two main aspects. Um, we have uh, uh, one uh, presenter, uh, Mr. Brick Natens. Uh, who is going to basically present or summarize some of the, some of the findings. Um, Mr. Nattens is a PhD researcher in international trade law at the Leuven Center 
for Global Governance Studies in, in um, the Slovenian University in Belgium. Uh, his doctoral research focuses on international trade in services at the multilateral and bilateral level. Uh, he's also published on various, various other trade law uh, issues. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I can announce it, but uh, as of March 2015, uh, you will join the International Trade Department of the Brussels branch of an international law firm. Um, so, um, we'll start with you, and uh, uh, after that, I'll move to uh, our, our three discussants, and I'll probably introduce them as we, as, we, as we go. So, without any further ado, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I will start off this debate by presenting some of the key facts and findings of the Peru Agricultural Products Panel Report. Um, First, let's have a look at the measure against which the complaint was brought. So, the measure is a Peruvian measure in which, on top of the ordinary import duty, there can be a variable duty on uh, four agricultural products, that is imported rice, sugar, yellow maize, and milk. Now, this variable duty is added um, if, or on the basis of what is called a price range system, which consists of a floor price and a ceiling price, and a reference price. So the floor price and the ceiling price create a fork, and the reference price is used to establish whether um, a variable duty is added or a variable duty is discount. So in short, if the reference price is below the floor price, a variable duty is added. If the reference price is higher than the ceiling price, there is a variable duty discount. Now, the rationale for this measure, according to Peru, is that this provides for stability for consumers because of the ceiling price or, and stability for domestic producers because of the floor price. Now, I understand that two other discussants here are but much better qualified than I to go into uh, the details for this price bench system, so I will focus more on the first element that was um, mentioned by Mr. Bellman, uh, that is the relationship between the multilateral trading system and the FTAs. Now, Guatemala, cha sorry. Guatemala challenged this measure on the basis that it violates both Articles 4.2 of the Agreement on Agriculture and Article 2.1b of the GATT 1994. Now, before going into uh, the substantive analysis, the panel had to assess whether the preliminary matter raised by Peru uh, needed to be taken into account. That matter had to do with admissibility or jurisdiction. Peru claimed that Guatemala had violated its good faith obligation by bringing the WTO claim against the price range system. And here the good faith obligation needs to be seen as a limit to a member's right to bring a WTO claim. Now the reasoning was that because there is an FTA between Peru and Guatemala that expressly allows Peru to maintain the price range system, Guatemala violates its good faith obligation by deciding to bring the claim. And there's an additional agreement on the basis of Article 18 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which is also an expression of good faith. Now, the panel said we can only rule on the invocation of public international law, so both the FTA and the Vienna Convention, insofar that this is based on a provision of the covered agreements. They made reference to the well-known statement of not in clinical isolation, but they make clear that they need a legal hook in order to do so, so take into account public international law. In this case, the hook was considered to be Articles 3.7 and 3.10 of the DSU. But let's say immediately that the panel found no evidence of a breach. Now, it mentioned two main reasons. The first reason, vis-à-vis -vis the FTA, was that the FTA had not yet entered into force. There, there where Guatemala did ratify the agreement, Peru had not yet ratified. And the panel said, well, then the agreement does not produce legal effects. The second main reason, based on the Article 18 Vienna Convention agreement, uh, argument, was that the Vienna Convention, um, that Article 18 of the Vienna Convention only requires that a member refrains, or a party to an FTA refrains from an act defeating the object and the purpose of that agreement. Now, what Peru did was claim that there was a violation of Article 18, and the panel said, well, we do not consider a violation of Article 18 of the Vienna Convention to be evidence of a violation of Article 3.7 and 3.10 of the DSU. 
I know that I'm supposed to present the findings, but please bear with me <laughs> if I have one, to. <laughs> one slide uh, in which I would like to propose my analysis of this, because this is the part that struck me most and the part that I like most about the Powell Report. Now, bear with me when I try to explain the reasoning. I think that Article 3.10 DSU indeed limits the right to bring a complaint. The appellate body has said this in E.C. Sugar and other cases. In other words, it limits the panel's jurisdiction. Now, you need a hook, and the hook is good faith. However, it's not just good faith in Article 3.10, but it's the procedural um, part or the procedural perspective on 3.10. There's also a substantive perspective, and that's the one of the U.S. Bird Amendment case, but that has nothing to do with this violation of 3.10. And if there is such a violation, this means that jurisdiction of the panel has not been validly established. And the result of it not being validly established is that the panel should decline to exercise its jurisdiction, its jurisdiction because the jurisdiction was not validly established. Now, how do you, prov how do you prove that there is something like that? The appellate body has said in EC Bananas 21.5 that you need a clear statement that no case will be brought. Now, such a clear statement will typically occur in a non-WTO agreement. I've listed two examples. For example, an exercised fork in the road provision in an FTA. Note that I say exercised. Or, for example, in the cotton MOU between the US and Brazil, in which is clearly stated that, there will not be a, that a, a case will not be brought. Now, in caso some people have said that the statement was insufficiently clear. So even though the, the agreement did not uh, enter into force, even if it would have, the statement is potentially not clear enough because the agreement can be interpreted in different ways. The, the PGFTA provision can be interpreted in different ways. Now, the crucial aspect, and that is where I think this case, the panel is right, but Peru went wrong, is that the panel should not determine whether rights and obligations in the clear statement, so in the non-WTO agreement. It should not say that there has been a violation of those provisions. What it should do is make a factual assessment to interpret Article 3.10 of the DSU. And this is why the panel correctly stated that a violation of Article 18 Vienna Convention is not what matters. It can indeed not establish that there has been a violation of Article 18. But if you consider the fork in the road example, because that's easier, Say there is an FTA with a dispute settlement mechanism and that once you t take the road of the FTA dispute settlement, you exercise the fork in the road provision. If the member then consecutively goes to the WTO, brings exactly the same claim, you could say that there has been a clear statement, i.e. you exercise the fork in the road provision, and subsequently that when you go to the WTO, you violate Article 3.10 DSU. The panel should then not, the WTO panel should then not say that a member has violated its obligations under the FTA. It should merely see, establish, that factually the fork in the road provision has been exercised and cons consequently there has been a clear statement. Now, the panel dismissed all of this because of, first of all, the fact that the uh, FTA had not entered into force and secondly that Peru presumably made a perhaps not perfect argument concerning Article 18 Vienna Convention. And it went on to the substance. Um, I will be relatively short on this, but what happened was that the panel needed to assess whether Article 4 of the, artic of the Agreement on Agriculture was violated. This article has been said by the panel to be a legal vehicle for requiring the conversion into ordinary customs duties of certain market access barriers affecting imports of agricultural products. Now, in footnote 1 to Article 4.2, 4 there is a listing of such um, market access barriers, which includes uh, variable import levies and minimum import prices such as those prescribed by the price range system. Therefore, the panel found that there was a violation of Article 4.2 of the Agreement on Agriculture. Subsequently, when addressing Article 2.1b of the GATT 1994, um, it made a similar reasoning where Article 2 prohibits other duties which is to be interpreted as other than ordinary customs duties unless they are listed. And the measures listed in footnote 1 to Article 4.2 cannot be ordinary customs duties because Article 4.2 requires these measures to be converted into ordinary customs duties, so they cannot be ordinary customs duties. The panel found that there was a violation of Article 2.1b of the GATT 1994. Finally, Peru argued that there was 
an inconsistency between the WTO and the FTA because the price range system apparently violated WTO rules, said the panel. However, Peru said the price range system is allowed under our FTA. Therefore, Peru argued that on the basis of Article 41 of the Vienna Convention, which contains a provision that allows the modification of a multilateral agreement between the parties in a subsequent bilateral agreement, Peru claimed that the, the right of Guatemala had been modified in the PGFTA. The panel dismissed this argument, saying that the FTA had not resorted to legal effects because it did not enter into force. And then finally, uh, on the question of appeal, I think this was a relevant findings, or not a finding, but a relevant aspect of the case as well. There has been a joint request by Peru and Guatemala to extend the deadline for the decision of either to appeal or let the DSB adopt the panel report because of the workload of the appellate body and the importance of initiating appeals in the order in which panel reports were circulated. The DSB agreed, and by the end of March, we will know whether there will be an appeal or not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, summarizing some of the, the main points and the main findings. Uh, I think that uh, creates a, a, a very good basis for, um, for our discussion. Um, so without any further ado, I'll, I'll move to our uh, three discussions, starting with uh, Professor Jos Paulin. Uh, I think you're probably well known to, uh, to uh, uh, most of you, Professor of International Law at uh, the Graduate uh, Institute. He's uh, written quite a bit on, on international economic law, particular trade law, investment law, uh, frequently advises government and industry in WTO disputes and investment arbitration. So I think you're perfectly qualified to, uh, uh, to comment on, uh, on uh, I guess, particularly on this uh, FTA WTO uh, issue, but also feel free to uh, comment on uh, other aspects of the, of the case. Thank you, Christoph. Um, yeah, I have a few ideas on both the, the substance and the FTA issue because I, I kind of 99% agree with what Brecht is saying. Flemish trade lawyers never disagree amongst themselves. Um, I, will, I will say a few things about the substance. So um, given the Chile price band uh, case law, I guess Peru always had an uphill battle to, to win this case on the substance of it. Uh, full disclosure, I worked for Chile in their price bans uh, case, and I think one shouldn't forget how the appellate body case law on this issue, and I hope Luisa and Claudia will refer to it, is questionable. But uh, as we all know, the appellate body never changes its mind. Um, I don't expect them to do it here. But, I mean, just to remind everyone that in this case, and in the Chile case as well, there were bound tariffs. Okay, um, Peru had a bound tariff, tariff ceiling of 68%. Okay, so they could go up to 68% on the products at issue. The applied rate was zero, or at maximum 6%. As Brecht was saying, the end outcome was that the system was nonetheless seen to be a violation because it was a variable import duty. Okay, but mind you, it, all of this variation stayed within the cap of 68% and was, compared to many other cases, very predictable. All the factors were laid out. It was quite transparent. Yet what Peru is doing here was found to be a violation of the Agreement on Agriculture. I've always been struck with the problem of reconciling that set of cases with what the appellate body found in um, Argentina textiles. Remember where the appellate body said, you can do whatever you want within your bindings as long as you stay within the, the bound rate, as long as you cap your, your system. So we have an outcome making it more difficult to have variable rates in agriculture than in industrial goods, which I, I, I don't think people, um, negotiators, meant to have. So when is something a variable import duty? according to the appellate body, when you have a set-out formula. So there's inherent variation, and there's a, a certain lack of transparency. But the main element is that there's inherent variation because of a formula. Now, think of this. Peru had a formula out there, so it inherently changed, I think, every two weeks. So the fact that it inherently changes makes it a violation. What if Peru now says, okay, we will 
take rid or get rid of the formula, um, completely close our books, and our trade minister every two weeks will reissue a statement on how the tariff rate will be within our 68% binding. Would that be okay? I guess it would be okay, but it, in my view, for traders, it would be much worse than, um, than the current system that Peru has. So it, there's a real systemic issue here. And I'm sure there's plenty, lots of countries who still have this variation on their books when it comes to duties. Now, if you look at how this panel uh, examined the case, they never asked what are ordinary customs duties. In other words, this Argentina textiles variation that is permitted. So really, anything that varies according to a formula would be not an ordinary customs duty, so it would be an other duty or charge, even on industrial goods, would be a violation, which is a, a, huge, um, a huge impact. And again, I don't think that was, was um, predicted. The one thing that I found interesting in this panel report, I'm not, I'm not sure how to uh, marry the two. In the Chile cases, the panel always found that there was a variable import levy or something similar to it, and a minimum import price. This panel found that the first is the case, but not the second. Which I, I so I, I don't know how to reconcile these two things. Um, but ultimately, and, and Brecht was saying so in the beginning, what Peru is trying to do here for agricultural products, basic commodities like rice, sugar, um, and, and a few other products, milk, is, is a certain degree of price stabilization. And I think it's, a I'm not saying based on the current rules, but it's a systemic issue out here. To what extent can countries try to stabilize prices in that set of uh, products? I think there's language in the preamble of the agreement on agriculture to take into account food security, non-trade concerns, being a net food importer, SND for developing countries. Another thing, under the safeguard system of the agreement on agriculture, when volumes go up or prices go down too much, you have the right to go above your binding above 68 percent. Strangely enough, Peru, even if these same things happen, cannot change or have a variable levy within its binding. We're talking a range between zero and 10 percent. So this leads me to, to ask myself, like, what does Peru have to do now? Of course, they could get rid of the entire system. The panel didn't say that they have to do so. They could change it. Could they just close their books and have their minister issue a new tariff um, every month? Or, and that goes to the second issue that Brecht um, mentioned, think of this, what if Peru, and apparently all it takes is a signature by the president, ratifies now the FDA? Would that implement the, the, the recommendation? Arguably it does, because that would change the, the order of priority between the FDA and the WTO commitment. So just a few things on the FDA uh, issue. As Christophe was saying, it really is a systemic huge um, problem out there. This concerns WTO, FTA interplay, but the same issue will arise, uh, has arisen already when it comes to interplays between different FTAs. There's been a case recently under CAFTA where Central American Customs Union said one thing, the CAFTA said another thing. How do you marry those two things? Um, I, I've done a paper on this looking at the numbers you have certain countries that have five overlapping PTA relationships. So you have a relation between two countries, WTO law, and five different levels of PTAs. You have one in five PTA ties between countries have double PTAs. And 78 of 138 WTO members, I'm counting the EU as one, has more than um, two PTAs in place in at least one relationship. So it's, it's an issue that we'll have to, to address both at the WTO level and at the PTA level. Now, I think there's, there's two different elements out there. The first one is what happened in this case, where you have two countries agreeing that a certain measure is okay. okay? And the second issue is <clears throat> we have two WTO members agreeing that certain disputes will be filed under their PTA. That's what EU member states do. You go to uh, the Court of Justice of the EU, you don't come to the WTO for a Belgium-France dispute. That's also what NAFTA says for certain types of disputes. So the first question is, can you consent to breach, as, as Guatemala and Peru arguably did, and get away with that breach when you're sued before a WTO panel? The second question is, can you waive your right to a WTO panel in the PTA? And I think both 
or possibilities. You see it done regularly that the big challenge is how will the WTO be able to digest uh, that reality? And I think Brecht gave a very plausible, a very conservative, a very solid line of reasoning that stays within the WTO covered agreements that offers that legal hook. To me, it is an issue of admissibility. If you've waived your right to bring a case before a WTO panel, your claim becomes inadmissible. If you want to have that legal hook of Article 310, fine. But under in international law, you have something um, already in the IOC articles on state responsibility. You can waive your right to in invoke responsibility of a state, Article 45. It's very common for states to do so. And I think if you say to a PTA partner that you won't file a case before the WTO, you'll deal with the dispute elsewhere. That is waiving your right to invoke responsibility. Nothing um, exceptional there. The, the second possibility is that you can send to breach, as arguably happened here. That's a, a little trickier, because if you want to look for a legal hook here, as Brecht um, pointed out, I, my view again is you don't need a legal hook. Uh, the articles on state responsibility make it very clear that you can consent to breach. This is Article 20. So if you've consented to breach, I mean, how can you still invoke uh, responsibility. If you want a legal hook, I would say have a look at Article 24 of, of GATT or the similar provision of, of GATT, so the enabling clause, so you can, you can find it um, out there. I guess for this particular case, the core issue is what Brecht mentioned, and that is that the language in the FTA, I think, plays out before the WTO as a factual issue. So you have to check whether there's any consent to breach, whether there's an agreement that the um, price uh, system was, was okay, or is there any evidence of a waiver of a right to, to bring a case? I don't think there was evidence in the PTA of a right to um, file a WTO complaint, but there is evidence in the PTA that there was consent to breach. Um, I can go on about this as many more detailed issues you could look into. The core issue in this case, but that's really exceptional and, and if you want to look at the systemic issues, we couldn't or we shouldn't perhaps spend too much time on this. The PTA, strangely enough, was not enforced. So how do we deal with that? Um, to me, it's a factual issue. Do you have enough evidence out there that leads to consent to breach? And that is debatable. Uh, the only regrettable thing I find is that certainly when it comes to the second part of um, the analysis, the, the panel really looked at Vienna Convention Article 41 as if the PTA would change the legal relationship between the parties. Again, I think it's a matter of, you know, facts. Do you have evidence of waiver or of consent to breach? But I'll, I will stop here and, and give the floor to the other uh, commentators. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joost, for, for, for commenting on both, uh, on both aspects, actually. That was quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, let, let us move to um, our next uh, discussant, Ambassador Claudia Hernandez, also well known to most people here, um, a career diplomat from the Dominican Republic, um, has been working in the mission since 1995, is that so? Why not? Um, but she's also participated in the negotiations of the, the, the free trade agreement between the Dominican Republic. Uh, Central America and the, and the United States. Um, uh, Claudia will focus more specifically on the, uh, the issue um, around the price band and concerns around uh, uh, how to stabilize prices. Uh, you might want also to maybe react to some of the things uh, that uh, Joost uh, uh, mentioned in that, uh, in that respect. Uh, in particularly, to me, it's still not very clear how, what is the, uh, uh, the difference between <laughs> what would be a variable levy and just the ability, as you suggested, of <laughs> you know, moving your, your, um, uh, your applied rate within the limits of your bound uh, uh, rates. Uh, is it the fact that you have a formula? Um, uh, is there something else? Uh, what does it mean in terms of countries' you know, ability <laughs> to play or uh, adjust their, their, uh, their tariffs within, within the range of their bound tariffs? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I am celebrating my 20th anniversary in Geneva, as the WTO does this year. <laughs> um, 
First of all, I would like to clarify that the, uh, the opinions that I will present in this intervention does uh, not represent the position of the Dominican Republic government vis-a-vis -vis this dispute. Um, I'm presenting it on my personal capacity and, and as you mentioned, uh, based on the experience I've had following the, in particular, the agriculture negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, um, I will not uh, explain again which are, how does it work, the price ban system, because I think everybody understands. And um, uh, I think from the point of view of uh, many developing countries uh, that have used this system, uh, it has contributed to, to give some kind of protection to the producer and to the consumer. Uh, because the way it works is uh, you raise the tariff when the price goes uh, fr uh, down from uh, the, the floor top of the price banner, and then if, if the price is high uh, than, the, than the ceiling, then you reduce the tariffs and, and you try to, to compensate and, and to, to avoid the distortions that are in the international agriculture market to avoid them to, to, to come into the, into the national market. In particular, in, in times, as, as you mentioned, Christoph, of high volatility in international prices. So it, we could argue that there is a, a, leg, a legitimate uh, policy objective here. Now, the, the system has been um, um, proven to be uh, inconsistent with WTO law, not only with this case, but also with the Chilean case. So I think uh, governments that are trying to, to, to protect their, their producers and consumers from the distortions that are in the agricultural sector, international sector, have to look for some other, um, for some other uh, possibilities. I try to, to look at uh, which, which kind of alternative uh, uh, the government could ha the, the go this government could have and i i as uh, just mentioned well the other possibility is to raise the applied tariff to the bound level now um i've raised some uh, some fao papers that say okay you just raise it to the bound level and you and you revise it every 5 years but is that something that really will uh, give a uh, uh, a better situation to the exporters and to the producers and the consumers because uh, uh, if in the case of Peru they just raise it to 68 percent and they will look at it again in five years maybe the exports uh, the exporters will suffer more than having a, 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 a system that is revised uh, in a more frequent way um, some uh, developing countries they, this this may not be may not prove to be a good solution because they have also low bound tariff level. So the other possibility is to renegotiate under Article 28 and to raise the bound level and the applied level to this new bound level. Um, again, we will be in the, in the first situation where you have now a new, a new applied tariff in a, in a higher level. Uh, another possibility is to introduce a tariff rate quota, which allows you to, to let uh, imports a certain quantity of imports at a certain tariff and then uh, when you have reached this quantity, then you, you raise the tariff again. This gives some, also some, some, um, some uh, uh, stability to the, to the market, but um, it, it doesn't have the element of protection of the consumer because you will raise the tariff again. And normally when you raise the tariff, the price will, the internal price will be raised also. And the other problem with this option is that you, when you renegotiate under Article 28, you will have to pay compensation in other products, of course. Uh, the other possibility is to apply anti-dumping measures. And uh, the, as you know, anti-dumping measures is more linked to the import price. Um, you have to uh, um, see if the import price is lower than the normal price. The problem with this is that when you have a high volatility in the, in the international prices, it's very difficult to determine which is the normal price of the product. And also, it's a procedure uh, where you have to make a, a very a strict uh, investigation to show the system of dumping and the damage uh, to the national producer and a causal effect. So it's not uh, a very easy instrument to be used by developing countries because of lack of resources and, la and lack of... of, of of technical uh, people that can do this investigation. The other one is 
uh, to, to apply countervailing measures. This one is linked more to the level of subsidies of a given product. And again, here you have to uh, make a, a, an investigation to show the evidence of subsidies, of damage, and of causal effect uh, with the same uh, issue that anti-dumping measures. The other possibility is a safeguard measure. measure. Here you're, you're not so linked to the, to the level of the price or to the system of subsidies, but to the level of imports. If you can show that the imports have raised so much that uh, it has caused damage to the national production through an investigation again, then you are, you're allowed to apply a, an additional tariff. And, uh, but again, we have the same limitation as the other two. Uh, Another option that is being more used by developed countries to, to, to try to help their producers is to use price support measures uh, that uh, is basically to help financially the producers when, uh, when the price uh, of, the, of the products uh, go uh, down, they will give uh, payments to the producers or they will pay an insurance. But this is a policy option more used by developed countries because they have the financial resources to this. And uh, in the majority of the developing countries, they don't have AMS commitments. So they are very, very constrained from the point of view of these options. Um, this is the last option, <laughs> which does not exist yet. Uh, I hope it will exist. It's uh, uh, the special mechanism for safeguard that uh, is being negotiated in the Doha round um, to be used by, the, by developing countries only. Uh, and it uh, would allow that when the price goes down from a certain level, from a reference price, uh, the countries uh, would uh, have the possibility to apply an additional tariff. But again, the condition is not available yet, and the conditions are being negotiated in the, in the round. So uh, going back to what just, just was saying, um, there are some policy objectives that are legitimate here because we are in a sector, agricultural sector, that have several distortion and have uh, high volatility in prices. Government have to find a way of uh, avoiding this distortion, destroy their agricultural sector. They have to find it in the legal uh, framework, in a legal way uh, that is consistent with their com international commitments, particularly in WTO. So whatever uh, they, will have, they, they can do will be constrained in this part but at the same time, they really have to look for a solution because I don't think any agriculture sector from a poor country can survive within the distortion without doing anything with these distortions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Claudia. Um, let's move to Luisa. Luisa Rodriguez, from also I think well known to, to most of you, uh, Economic Affairs Officer at, uh, at UNCTAD and has been working on these issues for a while. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Uh, Luisa, you have the floor. So hello, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I might in some aspects uh, sound a bit like what you just heard from Claudia. Uh, uh, the, the task that was given to me was thinking a bit in terms of this uh, policy perspective or debate behind the case. And what I thought about uh, reminding that may be useful also for the discussion that we're going to have is this aspect of the policy concerns that are underlying dealing with these types of price stabilization mechanisms. So I'm sorry if I sound uh, a bit uh, similar to what Claudia is going to say. I would say that I have some elements of my presentation that are going to touch upon also some points that she mentioned and some of the ones that just uh, the questions raised by just. So going back to these policy concerns, I think it's important to understand where, where the problematic comes from. And I wanted to maybe give a bit more details in terms of what these concerns are and this issue of managing the stability of prices within the borders. Okay, just so just as an introduction, mention that. There is this aspect of dealing with farmers' concerns, some of which Claudia mentioned, which is providing some sort of security for them to enable them to produce, which is important. So that's one policy concern, this policy perspective from the perspective of farmers. And from that point of view, you could say that by supporting price, you are directly 
providing an incentive for the production in a country. That's one point. Then there is this other social perspective that I felt f was a bit floating in what Claudia was mentioned, and it's this aspect of maintaining more of a social objective, which is related to maintaining the stability of the income of farmers. So from that point of view, looking at price stability from a policy perspective and from a farmer's perspective in particular comes from that angle, okay? Now, as Claudia said, there is not only an element that relates to producers, but also there is this consumer perspective. And I want to highlight both because I think that the delicate position in terms of a policymaker or someone who is going to design a mechanism to deal with this price uncertainty or volatility, there is also this aspect of consumers. And this idea is that if you have a price that is too low, then the producers don't have an incentive to produce either. So you have an interest in maintaining a certain level of prices in, in the sense that you want to ensure that there is a flow of supply into the country that enables consumers to consume. So that's the other perspective. So that's at the national level. Then I wanted to look at the trade arena. So that's like, a, like an introduction to the points that I'm going to make because I think when we jump into the case and we deal with this price issue directly, we might forget where we are coming from. So I thought that it could be useful to come back to that point. This idea of having differences between the home price and the international price, and this can lead to this difference affecting international prices. So we're talking about an internal situation that might lead to affect prices internationally. We're going from an international dimension, from a national dimension to an international dimension. And then we have another opposite view, which is something that I've seen or that I've noticed in debates related to trade and trade opening, which relates to countries, developing countries that have a situation that Claudia described, which is about you have an open trade regime, and when you have an open trade regime, maybe you import more, you're more subject to this price instability that you were mentioning when you started, uh, Christophe mentioned about why is this issue so important. So the idea here is that uh, uh, this instability through trade is connected uh, to this pro problematic. And from a developing country point of view, there might be a concern with the issue that if you have a situation of crisis like the one we had in 2008, for instance, there might be countries concerned with the fact that they are not able to procure at moments of crisis, such as the one we had in 2008, be able to access that type of food at a critical juncture in time. So I think this concern about ensuring that foodstuffs are available and can be traded is important from an international trade perspective. Then this element of the difficulty of regulating and making policies in that context where you have different points of view, different actors interacting. And I see the point that Claudia was mentioning that achieving a balance is a very delicate uh, situation in the sense that maybe you achieve a certain price that is beneficial for the consumer, but maybe you don't get that in terms of what the producer is expecting. So being able to have a price that is ideal in terms of uh, making policies and finding solution to this price problematic is important from that point of view, this balance that I was mentioning. Then there is another dynamic which concerns countries in the sense that when we look at the agriculture sector, we cannot say that the agricultural sector is homogeneous, meaning you might find yourself in a situation where you find yourself making policies or regulation in a context where you have different ways of producing agriculture. So you have sectors inside one country that might be more con competitive than others, and you have that maybe coexisting with more of a type of production that is more subsistence-like. So those are also considerations to make when you're dealing with these uh, price issues. Then of course in the trade arena you have very different perspective in terms of looking at this problematic from the side of the exporters, where for instance exporting uh, to certain countries might be an interest, a concern, and the perspective of importers uh, from the point of view of what I was mentioning before, where you might face a situation like you have in, you, in 2008, where you needed the foodstuff and it was not possible to access them. So there might be a concern from the side of the importer of being able to develop the capacity of agriculture internally. Uh, and so the, the different um, points of view and 
different concerns that you have to balance. I mean, both, both perspectives, I would go beyond what Claudia said, both are legitimate concerns, but then balancing them in the context of the broader uh, set of rules that we have in the WTO or the broader set of negotiations that we have here. So going back to what can be done, what can be done, and I was mentioning before um, this aspect of you have a problem related to prices, but maybe the solutions do not only relate to trade policy measures. That's not maybe the, the, the area where you're going to get your solutions from. There might be other complementary policies that might be used in order to get to that point. And there is another, um, so I want to from the trade policy perspective, I think that Claudia made a very good presentation in terms of talking about the possible measures that we have. She mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, this variation of tariffs within the bound rates, which could be an issue in terms of um, um, possible policy options. She also uh, made reference to the safeguard possibility in, in the agreement. Um, I'm not sure she mentioned the SSG in her presentation, though. She mentioned the general uh, agriculture uh, safeguard, but there is also another specific safeguard for agriculture that can be used, so that's another option. And then I was going to say, as she said, aside from these aspects that relate to very punctual instrument, tariff instruments, there is this whole pillar of subsidies where you can find also instruments that can be useful in terms of uh, promoting these productive capacities or improving institutional factors that affect production and have an indirect effect on prices. We're talking about uh, price support for farmers that she already mentioned, or subsidies that relate to providing uh, subsidized foodstuffs to consumers at a certain level. That can also be useful. Now, there are other non-trade policy measures that can be useful, uh, which is relates to a um, mechanism that can serve as a concertation or coordination mechanism between production and consumption at the national level. So I'll just give a couple of examples. This uh, regional or national stock management systems. We, had, we saw one example of this happening when we had the crisis in 2008. It, uh, I know Senegal was part of it. It was, it's happened in West Africa, and the idea is basically that you stabilize prices by buying uh, commodities at a certain point in time, and then you release it at another point in time. And by that, you are able to intervene at a certain moment in the market in order to induce certain uh, price effects. Let's put it like that. Then there are also examples of state trading enterprises. Say state trading enterprises, we have discussions happening in the WTO in terms of redefining the boundaries of what is admissible and what is not. But the, the truth is that state trading enterprises, by engaging in purchase and sale operations at a particular point in time, can also play that role in terms of intervening or participating in the market at a key point in time when you have a pro going, not going, ensuring that you don't go beyond a certain level so that you can ensure that prices remain uh, within certain boundaries. Then there are other instruments, risk management instruments, and um, is another option. I think Claudia mentioned it uh, very briefly. So this is just like in terms of the panoramic view of what is available and what is possible. Now I would like to go back to a question that Just asked, and in this sense I would agree with his interpretation of this variability component of what was mentioned in the panel. And the key question here will be, are systems in general that provide for duties at the border that will vary depending on the price fluctuations, uh, is that forbidden? Is that completely forbidden? Given the context that we had with the price band system, the context that we had in this particular case, can we really say that this is a no-go zone uh, uh, like that? And I would say that it depends. I would go back to the point that he was mentioning in the sense that the way the measures are designed have a lot to do in terms of what is admissible, defining if it is permissible or not. In this case in particular, we have to remember that the panel said that the panel was not about the system itself. It was about the duties that come from applying or using the system. So these are two distinct different things because we come into this ground of 
how the duty is determined. No, you have some factors that related to how this is calculated with the formula, the element that Just was mentioning. We also had some issues that were raised in terms of how this is published, how this is applied. So uh, I would, this is a provocative thought. This is just my thought about this. So in theory, let's think that we have a system that, ha that allows for less variation, exactly like the example that Just was mentioning, this n notification that goes from the government in terms of establishing bound tariff at its top admissible level. A system that allows for less variation and which does not allow for this intrinsic variability component that is included in the formula. A system that could maybe reflect more accurately some price tend in the international markets because there were some elements of the case that, that gate leads to this point of saying that the, there was a lot, there was insulation from the uh, production from at, at the national level because of the mechanism. So there was like this intrinsic questions about how these price trends are reflected into and calculated through this formula and derived into this additional duty that is uh, used. Let's assume that this um, imaginative system is easier to calculate or administrate also. Let's assume that. And let's assume that such an imaginary system will translate into an ordinary custom duty or another duty or charge that is recorded in a schedule. So in theory, if we have all of those components that were the issues that were raised in the panel, a system that envisages, envisages a certain degree of variability of tariffs depending on prices, could we say that this is possible? I mean, it's a thought. No, I, this is my interpretation, that this would be possible. No. Um, then a couple of points on this predictability and distortive effect, touching upon one issue that Claudia mentioned, and it's this aspect of, of course, uh, we are talking about markets and the agricultural trading system, which is highly distortive. So we are faced with a situation or with a decision that leads to reducing the scope of what can be done in particular circumstances for certain countries, and I would say that there are other elements or policy measures that exist that are legal, that are recorded in the schedule. We could talk about the SSG, which is, for instance, a safeguard that is only available to certain countries but not to others, or to subsidies, which is also the case of being available for some or not to others, or due to this financial constraint that Claudia was saying is not really accessible to everybody. So this concept of dealing with the distortion and the effective trade distortion and how to cope with the instability of the market, I mean, for me, remains open in the sense that we are facing an evolution of the system where we have reduced space to have border measures being used for this purpose on the one hand, but you have certain other practices that are accepted and exist and have not been curbed so far by the existing agreements. Um, but then you have disciplines also. This was with respect to border measures, but we have also disciplines that are developing with respect of some of the instruments that are measured. For instance, I mentioned this aspect of state trading enterprises. This is happening. It's uh, right now, these disciplines that are being crafted. So I would just say that in terms of the future evolution, I would say that these spaces that exist currently in terms of being able to use certain of these instruments, I would say that is being further and further reduced. No? And then um, the, this SSM idea, no? this is in parallel. This is another negotiation. We could view the SSM, and I would share Claudia's uh, um, comment in this sense that maybe we are in face of a situation where there is a new instrument that will be created that would be accessible to all that could uh, be possibly uh, dealing with this problematic. It is not decided. It is not finished. Uh, um, on the other hand, is there some lessons that we can build from this case in terms of the elements that you just mentioned, in terms of the discussion of the triggers when we discuss triggers for the SSM, should we be incorporating that dimension when we discuss SSM? So just a few thoughts to, um, for you to discuss. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Luisa, for these, um, these comments, which yeah, overlap to some extent with Claudia, but I think you've also added a lot of, uh, of other, uh, other elements. So, um, so we have quite a number of issues that have been uh, 
um, put on the table. Uh, let me open the floor for um, questions, comments, uh, on particularly on the on the on the issues that have been raised. But also feel free to raise any other uh, issues if uh, if needed. Who wants to start? Hannes. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, really. Um, I think this will go down in history as one of the most interesting talking disputes so far, if I may. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think the, the fundamental question that everyone has, has raised, but I, I, I was particularly um, intrigued by the last two speakers, really, is to what extent is the system we're looking at, WTO, uh, able to cope with legitimate needs for flexibility? Um, the system obviously s is designed to uh, create relatively stable, rigid rules to create f a framework for people to operate in, create stability for traders, predictability, and all those things. And those um, functions are, are clearly understood by most. Um, but the question is, have we, have we thrown out the baby with the bathtub by creating rules that are often too rigid to address entirely legitimate situations. And if you just look at the current Swiss franc crisis here in Switzerland, um, and you uh, just assess what that has done to NGOs in Geneva or exporters in Switzerland, overnight 20% loss of their purchasing power, um, and you ask the question, should there be time for them to adjust? Should there be tools for them to adjust? The answer is obviously yes. It's not an attack on the system if you allow for that to happen. And I think in that sense, the question is, is that, 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 that the first two speakers uh, really raised. Um, can, we, can we create systems that truly address legitimate concerns, that don't uh, throw us back to footnotes that were devised with good intentions in mind sometime in 1994, um, or perhaps more broadly, to what extent should panels and the appellate body be empowered to take systemic concerns into their interpretation? My feeling is that often the courage to do so is limited, and I think it should be greater. But that's a question to everyone on the panel, um, open for uh, comment. Thank you, Hannes. So not enough courage? Who wants to answer? Greg? Jos? No. <laughs> everything I've heard in terms of alternatives to the current Peruvian system, I, I find worse. I mean, I, I never suggested going up, <coughs> up to the 68% or anti-dumping countervailing duties. I mean, these countries have a hard time using its subsidies. Having state-owned enterprises come in or government stockpiling, I mean, I can only imagine that this will be far worse than a system that is, after all, relatively transparent. I don't know why these cases are filed, honestly. I, uh, the Chile case, it's mainly political. Argentina doesn't like Chile. I don't know Guatemala and Peru. What is behind it? Honestly, I would like to know because everyone in Latin America has a system like this, it seems. So I, I don't see the economic rationality behind going after this thing, knowing that all the other things are worse. Remember, Argentina, the textile, textiles case I mentioned, the next thing they did when they lost the textiles case was to impose a safeguard. Is that, is that better, more transparent? I, I doubt it. What, what Hannes was saying, to me, if you look at th this whole thing comes from an appellate body interpretation, a very textual interpretation of a footnote, variable um, import levies. Okay, and if you open a dictionary, variable import levies, sure, it's covered. But it, it, shouldn't they go a little beyond the dictionary and look at the, you know, what's really happening here, what are the, the alternatives out there? It's a casebook example of textualism that has gone over the top, I think. But, but I, I, I told you I'm biased. But I, fi I find it a very problematic outcome. And I'm, I'm, I was really impressed with, with your views, which, which, of course, make us sound very legalistic. But it's, that's the reality. Yeah. Thank you. You want to add something? I think that I'm perhaps a bit too conservative in that regard. Uh, so really taking the systemic concerns into account, I think, of course, who can be against it? But 
if we're following the way things are being done here, we still need a legal hook, I'm afraid. Any other co questions, comments? Please, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm so uh, interested in uh, to listening the uh, the uh, debate, uh, particularly uh, the uh, the Peru's um, bound rate is 68 percent, and uh, assuming that you know uh, appellate body uh, upheld the panel report, and uh, alternative way was discussed is maybe to raise up the other uh, tariff rate is the one of the option, but the uh, uh, it's not legitimate way is. It's quite important questions, and um, I'm just questioning that the uh, uh, while listening to your debate, uh, looking at the uh, uh, agriculture uh, article four uh, footnote one, and uh, Professor uh, Paulin actually arguing that variable import levies, that levies, but uh, the third sentence of the other uh, footnote is also saying other than ordinary customs duties. And my, my, my understanding is that maybe variable customs duties, but it's not variable customs levies. That, that is the uh, price band system's uh, meaning. I'm not quite sure I'm, wrong, I'm not right or wrong, but also there's the, uh, the Chile price band um, argument was exist. So there's the, um, <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, jurisprudence is there, but um, maybe uh, this discussion, this issue, should be carefully scrutinized. The the meaning of that sentence, not just three word, you know, a variable customs levies and decision. So that's my impression. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting comments. Any, yeah, yes. I, I, I fully agree. I think it's that's that would be the start of a better approach where you don't look at the three words, but you contrast variable import levies. As you were saying, it must be something other than ordinary customs duties. Now, the, this panel here explicitly said when it declined to rule that these are minimum import prices, that the system works exactly like a specific tariff, specific duty. It's not a minimum import price. Now, is that not evidence, arguably, that it's an ordinary customs duty then? The, the other contextual point is, and this is not in the footnote, but in the text, we, we have to be talking of measures which have been required to be converted. Um, Peru, Chile, all these uh, price band systems were there way before the schedules. They were in place when these things were negotiated when the Uruguay round was concluded. No one said you have to convert this. No one did convert it. So isn't that an argument to say these were not measures which were required to be converted? But of course, this is all water under the bridge if you follow an appellate body textual approach where you say if there's a formula. If the, it's the sad story of textual interpretation. You end up with the appellate body divisions mechanically repeating the, 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 the factors and yeah, everything is a variable import levy now. Well, on, on this point, I was just wondering, uh, listening to, to, to some of you, um, a number of countries still maintain non ad valorem duties, uh, which are specific mm -hmm. duties. And the effect of non ad valorem duties is exactly the same in, in, in the sense that, you know, when the prices go down, the level of protection increases. When the prices go up, the level of protection decreases. And probably even less predictable, and maybe more predictable for exporters, but definitely less predictable for, uh, for, um, uh, for consumers. Um, so in that respect, you know, you, you might end up with using those kind of, uh, um, um, so is, is a non ad valorem duty could be considered as a variable levy? That one wouldn't have the formula. That's, uh, as you were saying, that's the kind of legal hook, as you like to call it, that they now go for every time. But there's an irony there because a formula, if you publish it, it actually makes it more yeah. transparent rather than less. So there's a real, I would want to be any of these governments, it's really tough what they have to do now. Uh, Claudia, and then uh, give the I'm not there. a lawyer, 
there are very good lawyers here, but as, as much as I know, uh, specific duties are not prohibited by, by WTO law. But again, as you mentioned, they, they are also quite distorting. So something has to be <laughs> think about. Yes, yeah, maybe just on this point, I think um, specific duties often are scheduled as such. Actually, so it, in that sense, they're part of the part of the the, the agreement. <clears throat> uh, one comment on the whether the system is too rigid. Uh, I think, um, uh, as the panel has pointed out on various occasions, there there are so many alternatives you can take to this price band system that I would very much uh, disagree with the fact that the system is too rigid. It's just. Unfortunately, the design, the policy design chosen, uh, was declared uh, as inconsistent with the law. So Peru basically was unlucky. But the, the system is not too rigid. It's just bad luck, basically. And out of that, <clears throat> out of that, maybe a, a question uh, to the panel: um, Given the wider range of uh, alternative, uh, uh, I would say, weapons that Peru had at its disposal. Uh, why was it not possible to find an out-of-court uh, settlement uh, since, since uh, uh, Peru had various uh, arguments to bring into play for such a settlement? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, reaction. I would say, following the, the comment, that developing countries in general were, were unlucky because the, the instrument that they have access to which I mentioned some of them are not so easy for them to use. Developed countries uh, were maybe more, not lucky, more intelligent negotiating, I don't know, but they have all the instruments. They have SSG, they have uh, domestic support, they have price support systems, uh, which unfortunately developing countries does not have so, so easy access for, to those instruments that are allowed by the system. Well, if, if, I, if I may just abuse my, my position as, <laughs> as chair. I would also maybe slightly disagree also with this, the fact that there are so many other alternatives. I, I think we've heard a lot of alternatives mentioned both by, by Luisa and Claudia, but I think that most of these are policy measures that are trying to address another problem. Um, here we're talking about a very specific issue, which is short-term price volatility and short-term price variation. It's not the same problem as removing distortions due to dumping or, uh, or, or subsidies or uh, 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 quotas uh, 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 and this kind of thing. So in that respect, the number of instruments that you can really use to, to deal with that specific problem are, are, are much more limited than the, the whole set of instruments you've just uh, described. Uh, and in that case, well, yes, you have counter-cyclical payments, uh, you have insurance schemes, uh, which are, uh, are allowed for, for, for certain countries, maybe some, uh, some public stockholding uh, schemes, but, but it's, not, it's not as if you had that many, uh, that many options. But I, I, I agree with the fundamental point you make in that there is a lot of flexibility. Um, so I would also be very hesitant to say, okay, we need more flexibility for developing countries, we need more, what you call it, SMMs and state-owned enterprises, and so to kind of continue to open the, without tackling this particular issue here. I think there's enough flexibility, but in terms of optimal policy instruments, we get priorities wrong. The, arguably what they were trying to do here was made economically more sense than some of the alternatives out there. So it's more costly to go for something that is legal than for something that is illegal. And I'm not entirely sure about this, but it seems to me that this is the case. And I, I think you're an economist, so that I, in that sense I would agree with you. Yeah, but that's, so, so that points to the second question, why no out-of-court settlement? If that's, if that's better for Guatemala, why couldn't they sell this as, 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 a, as a system to keep? I think it's because this was not part of the discussion of the panel. I mean, the panel examined some arguments that are presented to them in terms of deciding on a, a scope, on, the, on, on, a, on a topic that is narrowly defined, let's put it like that. So this is, um, I think, part of the situation that maybe it didn't examine other policy options to deal with this problem, but it only examined the, re the relevant duties that were put up to the panel to examine. I mean, so it didn't 
contrast with other possibilities. I mean, this was not part of the uh, discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments from the floor? Yes, over there, gentlemen. Um, just had an observation that um, since we're talking about developing countries, uh, probably it's an irony that both the complainant and respondent were developing countries, and it's not a developed versus developing country issue here, at least. Uh, and the second issue about the, the systemic implications and um, the way to interpret Article 4.2. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, don't you think, uh, just a comment on, ultimately you have to find a solution within the legal framework. So. Um, it, it's, it's, it's fine to uh, raise the systemic issue of other options or so on, but unless there is an interpretation that fits into footnote one of the PRS as, uh, as an ordinary customs duty, there's, there's no way you can get out of the AOA. So, um, of course, the Doha round uh, is a solution, but I don't know whether we'll be discussing this 10 years later, but as a legal issue, I think uh, the, the issue is whether there is another legal interpretation to the footnote one. That's, that's the legal issue that developing countries have to see now. Thank you. Is there any other legal interpretation? No, I, I think the, 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 the option there is what I mentioned in the very beginning. Um, following the Argentina textiles case, where Argentina was allowed to move, even though it had a bound ad valorem duty, it was allowed to change into a specific duty. So Peru could do that, change to a specific duty, as long as there's a cap of 60, 68%, they are fine. And if they want to, they can change it every two months, just avoiding a formula. And they are fine, if you ask me. But is that a, does that make more economic sense? Is it better? Probably not, but it's legal, so let's do it. Yeah. Thank you. Risa and then uh, Hannes. I think it's a very relevant question, but then what are the avenues? Should we wait for another case to be brought uh, to interpret this? Should we look for avenues in terms of negotiating new trade disciplines? I mean, I think your question is very relevant, but I am I, I keep thinking what is the, how could we approach this issue in another forum, should we wait for another? Because dispute settlement cases are ruling on the basis on a case by case basis on a particular measure that is at, each, at issue. So at the end, you don't get a cross cutting type of reflection in terms of interpreting the types of measures that you're uh, that you're indicating. So, so I mean, I'm, I think it's a very relevant question. What is the avenue to raise this type of concern in the WTO? Uh, it, wouldn't, it would seem that on an isolated dispute settlement case basis is n maybe not the best way, but then should we open a, uh, an avenue to negotiate about this to reinterpret uh, the meaning? I mean, it's, I think it's a very relevant question. Hannes. Mm -hmm. Luisa, what is the avenue? Of course, you talk about it at talking disputes. That's mm -hmm. the obvious <laughs> solution. <laughs> Uh, or at least the <laughs> first step. Um, I think in terms of legal interpretation, Brecht, I appreciate the legal hook, but honestly, the legal hook is no obstacle for me. I, I, you know, I got the Vienna Convention, I got co object and purpose, I got context, there's a lot of context. And within context, my question is, and that's the one that Joost and others have, have brought up, um, to what extent can counterfactuals be, uh, be part of a legal interpretative exercise? To what extent, meaning, showing the absurdity of a certain solution in certain cases, even if it's not the case at hand, um, um, or, or not absurdity, maybe perhaps the, the contradictions uh, uh, to be a little bit less um, um, uh, firebrandish here. Um, but also the question is, 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 is how does that compare to other solutions that the system obviously condones or perhaps even promotes? Um, and if, if something that I'm proposing is, is in some ways perhaps even obviously better than a solution that is proposed by the system as legal, but I do find some textual, textual hook to invalidate what I'm doing, then the system is in substance contradicting itself. And I think this type of systemic consideration can very well be part of legal interpretation, and it should, and it has always been. The only question is how far, uh, how far are panels and the appellate body willing to go, and I entirely understand their reluctance to go very far. But I think we, 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 we may be up to something if we listen to Claudia and to Luisa today 
um, we may be up to something here, and, and, and there are more volatilities out there in this world, and maybe these volatilities do have actually changed in the past 20 years. And if so, then uh, I think the question is, can we, can we adjust them in, in, a, in a legitimate le interpretative move? And I think, um, I think lawyers can do that. Uh, and of course, there are also non-lawyers on the appellate body. I think you're, you're absolutely making sense. And I think that if you look at, for example, the interpretation of reasonably available less trade restrictive alternative, that you could bring such considerations into, into, in, in, into, the, into the analysis. But the system is what it is to some extent, and they are careful. And so you need a place, a legal place, to bring in these arguments. And I'm assuming here, I really, I don't know the case on, on 4.2 uh, at all, but apparently there was no room to take these things into account within this legal analysis. And I think that this may be sad if you look at the, the outcome, but if it's not legal, it's not legal. And in the end, it's a legal analysis of these arguments. And I mean, I, I may be sounding very conservative here, and I really, it's, it's very hard to assess when you have people next to you who are saying this is an economically very unviable situation, but in the end, as a lawyer, and if you're in the appellate body, you need to look at the law and, and apply it, so. Thanks. Any other? On this? Yeah, yes. just on, on that, I think, uh, as I was trying to say on, on 4.2, um, it's all water under the bridge because the appellate body has given its view, but there's, other, there's, there's more than these three words. As people were reading them out, you have the other text in the footnote, you have the article itself, you have the preamble that I was referring to, lots of context you could refer to to allow for this. The question then is where do you draw the line, and it's not an easy thing to, to do. On the legal hook for the procedural issues of can you agree in a PTA to what is otherwise a breach or not to go to the WTO, there's at least two cases where they refer to non-WTO covered agreements to change what the WTO treaty says without a legal hook. Um, one set of cases is when they refer to understandings or uh, settlements. And then they say if it's clear enough <clears throat> that you've kind of waived your rights to a WTO panel, then uh, we will uh, not allow you to do this. They didn't refer, if I remember correctly, to 310 or good faith or what have you. Second case is where they allowed parties to waive their right to confidential hearings before the appellate body, which, I mean, to me, legally speaking, that was a huge game changer. I know it's procedural and it's an agreement within a dispute case, but technically speaking, that is a bilateral agreement between two states, not part of the WTO covered agreements, that contracts out of the DSU. The DSU explicitly says hearings shall be confidential. You can bilaterally agree to waive that right to confidentiality. And I think it's, I can see it's a step removed because all of the, the things I refer to are happening somehow within the WTO context. But mind you, they are not part of the WTO covered agreements. The next step is to do the same with an FDA. And if you have a legal hook, fine. But if you don't have it, I don't think it should stop you from moving forward. As Hannes was saying, you have the rules of interpretation, 313A, C, could refer to bilateral agreements to shed light on what the WTO means, at least between the two disputing parties. Why not? Technically, you could even have done it in this case. The peru Guatemala case, the FTA is not in force, but it's an agreement, you could say. And in other case law, the appellate body has referred to the Doha Declaration to a TBT committee decision, those things are not legally binding, but they've been referred to under 313A. So arguably you could do the same for a PTA that is not in force yet. I mean, I'm just throwing out ideas here that are avenues to make all of this happen. And I, I, I agree, it will happen slowly, but ultimately it will find its way in there. And it will happen step by step. So I'm less worried about the procedural elements here. Um, I think you're referring to the understanding on bananas? Yes. Sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've had a discussion with this uh, with some people who know much more about this than I do, and they made this argument that it is actually non -a, not a strictly non-WTO agreement. Yeah, and so, it's as you've said elsewhere, it's probably a matter of degree more than anything else. 
Um, but if you compare the, the understandings and then a, uh, an understanding such, such as the Cotton MOU, which is about one specific dispute, and then an FTA in which there is a fork in the road type provision, you have several avenues and several um, degrees of, of, of in, in which we can imagine that it will be going. Interesting. Any other comments from the floor? Questions? Well, if that's not the case, I let me just read one of the questions that we got from Twitter <laughs> by Simon Lester. I think it has been kind of partially addressed, but uh, let me let me let me pose the question anyway. Yeah? Uh, on what WTO legal basis, other than Article 24, can Peru invoke an FTA as a defense? Well, clearly Article 310. Um, yes. As I've, as I've explained, that's, that's my perspective on it. Um, but the fact that it didn't enter into force is clearly problematic here. But in a perfect situation where the conditions are fulfilled for what I said in, in, in the beginning, um, where there is a clear um, statement in a non-WTO agreement and it has been exercised, then I think uh, it could be done through 310. I think Article 310 can be a sort of catch-all for these procedural type issues if you look at it from a procedural uh, perspective. It's, it's the legal impediments that the appellate body was talking about in Mexico soft drinks. It's 37310 DSU. And you can make use of this procedural uh, avenue they created in 215 Bananas to, to bring these uh, FTAs, for example, but also other agreements into, into these disputes, I think. By the way, do, you, do you want to comment just on the, on the point that I think Joost made, which is, well, one way to implement the decision would be for Peru to ratify the, um, the agreement. Would that, would that uh, uh, kind of address the issue in your, in your view? I don't know how this works procedurally because I don't know in, to what extent the change in facts can be taken into account by the appellate body. I, I really don't know. So this would change the factual constellation considerably, but how does this work procedurally? Anyone who has more experience can probably explain. No, I was thinking more uh, assuming that this would be adopted now and there wouldn't be an appeal then Peru, Peru can say, I'm taking this measure to bring the thing into compliance. That brings me into compliance. It's for Guatemala to sue me under a 21-5 proceeding. Now, if they do it now, between now and the appellate body decision, yeah, that, that, normally new facts, <coughs> it's unclear whether the appellate body will be able to look at that. Or in most cases, they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Peru better wait a while before. <laughs> I don't know if we have Peru in the room. But <laughs> uh, let me uh, see if there is any other uh, remarks or, or, or question from the floor. Well, if that's not the case, let me uh, uh, first of all uh, Thank all of you. Uh, I'd like to thank in particular um, uh, Finland, uh, Finland's contribution, thanks, thanks to which this uh, uh, meeting, we were, were, were able to hold this meeting in this, uh, in this particular place. Uh, Finland has also, uh, beyond uh, this, provided a lot of uh, support in, in, in the work that ICTSD has been doing generally on, 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 uh, on legal issues. Uh, let me thank our speaker uh, and, uh, and, our, uh, and our discussant, uh, and of course WTI advisors for their partnership in this, uh, in this event. Uh, thank you all. We'll, we'll see you after the next dispute with a systemic <laughs> uh, implication. Again, I think it's, 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 it is important to have this kind of discussions, not so much to, um, I think, discuss the, the the, the, the case in itself, but, but really the, the, the implications and, 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 and uh, particularly the systemic implications and other implications beyond the specific, uh, the specific case. And that's, that's very much the intention that we're trying to, uh, to, um, uh, to have uh, here. So with this, uh, thank you all and have a 
Nice afternoon.